Greetings and welcome back to room 303. We are now together to discuss F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, what many consider one of the greatest novels in the history of American literature. Now, to be fair, you really can't make the evaluation or the judgment of a novel such as this until you've spent a little time reading the novel, thinking about the novel, working through the novel, and so our goal here is to give some uh, background information that can help you read the novel. One of the first things I'll point out, often overlooked, is the title. It actually isn't called Gatsby. It isn't called Great Gatsby. It's called The Great Gatsby. That article, The, matters in this novel. In other words, Gatsby is going to be a symbol of a whole lot that actually doesn't exist. In some ways, Gatsby will be representative of something that's not actually real, a contrivance. Some will argue the American dream. Obviously, there's a whole lot that's been said about that, and it's possible that maybe you'll, uh, you'll, be, you'll read this as well. The other thing that I want to point out right away is that this novel, The Great Gatsby, isn't actually about Gatsby. This is always a shock because films of this novel are always going to emphasize more Gatsby himself. But when you actually read the novel, this is what we call a Buildings Roman. You'll remember that term. In other words, a story of coming of age. So, for example, we think in the Odyssey, of Homer's Odyssey, of young Telemachus coming of age, the Buildings Roman. We think, for example, of any number of other kinds of texts. Catcher in the Rye comes to mind, right? So Holden will be coming of age, learning new things, trying to understand new things. This is really a story about a guy named Nick, who is a young man, in comparison to so many of the folks that are in this novel, and he comes to realize a whole lot of things that he does not like to realize. And we'll, we'll dip into the novel periodically to see a few things at the end, right? And, and as well, this novel, not along with being a buildings Roman, will be a critique of the idea of the American dream. And, of course, it's also a love story. We don't want to, we don't want to overlook that. This, this novel is certainly that as well. Uh, it, it is set in the Roaring Twenties, a time when uh, total chaos... Everything can be smashed and be reappropriated by a certain strata of folks, and we're going to see that, in fact, Nick is uh, he's going to be he's going to be troubled by this fact, and, and and we'll get into it as we as we review the events of the novel. Now, let's go through it quickly just to uh, review the uh, primary events of the novel. My assumption is that you've either read the novel or are about to read the novel, so I'm not going to tell you everything, obviously, in the novel, and I will say. Almost without exception, almost every single film that's been attempted of this novel has struggled to be very successful. Certainly people who read the novel will say this because there's so much that's left out because the novel is actually Fitzgerald's playing with language. Much of Nick is in fact going to uh, you know, play out from the life of Fitzgerald himself, who himself struggled with a whole lot of the recognitions that Nick will make in this novel, especially about those who are, can we call them privileged or we can call them uh, affluent, and the way in which they live their life with such cavalier attitude towards uh, themselves and their world. We meet right away <clears throat> the narrator of the novel, Nick Carraway. Now, he is our uh, storyteller. He is the means whereby we will meet all of these different amazing characters that Fitzgerald, of course, is so great at creating. Um, he, of course, will graduate uh, from uh, the, uh, an, an elite school, Yale. He comes, however, from the Midwest. And in many ways, the novel is kind of cyclical in that regard. Nick will come from the Midwest, arrive in the East Coast. He'll live there outside of New York City and Long Island. And ultimately, at the end of the novel, he will return back to the Midwest. Obviously not the same Nick that he was at the beginning of the novel. He's there as a bond salesman. He's there ostensibly to figure out a way to make money. And yet he's going to live in and around all these people that have so much wealth they can't even get rid of it type of thing. Okay. Um, ironically, he will live right next to Jay Gatsby in this small little house and in what is the area called West Egg. This is where the new money is as opposed to East Egg where the old uh, money is. And of course, across the bay where East Egg is, uh, well, that will be where we will find then the, uh, you know, the source of so much of the conflict of the novel because 
it's going to be about a girl. It's going to be about a girl. So let's just get that out of the way right away. In the same way that in Fitzgerald's life, it was about Zelda, his girl, right? Now, Nick's cousin, Daisy, is uh, the girl, and she's married to this disgusting guy named Tom Buchanan. And Tom is kind of the... Uh, the oof of the, uh, he's almost the comic uh, relief in some ways, although not always comic. He's, he's a mean guy, he is un, he's, not, he, he's not a welcoming guy, um, and he is the husband of, of this Daisy. Uh, Nick will go to uh, a dinner, uh, because Nick is related to Daisy as a second cousin. And the very first uh, um, time that we meet what I call Fitzgerald's genius prose, um, we're, we're meeting Nick, who is about to see Daisy and uh, a potential love interest uh, named Jordan Baker. He says it this way. Uh, it wa he, we walk through a high hallway into a bright rose-colored space, gradually bound into the house by French windows at either end. The windows were ajar and gleaming white against the fresh grass outside that seemed to grow a little way into the house. A breeze blew through the room, blew curtains in at one end and out the other like pale flags, twisting them up toward the frosted wedding cake of the ceiling and then rippled over the wine-colored rug, making a shadow on it as a wind does on the sea. The only completely stationary object in the room was an enormous couch on which two young women were buoyed up as though upon an anchored balloon. They were both in white, and their dresses were rippling and fluttering as if they had just been blown back in after a short flight around the house. I must have stood for a few moments listening to the whip and snap of the curtains and the groan of a picture on the wall. Then there was a boom as Tom Buchanan shut the rear windows and the caught air died out about the room, and the curtains and the rugs and the two young women ballooned slowly to the floor. Now, I would challenge any of you that think you might want to go into filmmaking to try and take that scene and put it into a, a, a film scene. And of course, it's been attempted, but what makes Fitzgerald's prose so powerful is that you can get that sense of it's, it's, it's ethereal. It's like it's not even there. And then all of a sudden, Tom Buchanan will shut a window and then everything, and now we're back to reality. And that's going to be the way to read this novel. We move from the imagery, from the unreal back to the real, and we're going to dance back and forth between it. Um, we will meet uh, Tom, and we're going to realize that Tom messes around on Daisy. He's got a love interest of his own. Um, and, um, and, and this will allow us to already begin to see there is all kinds of nasty tension going on here. They have a child, Tom and Daisy. Clearly this child is you know, not really the center of their lives. And they both live this kind of quiet, va vacuous life. And, and yet Tom, of course, is this uh, profound pseudo-intellectual. And we're going to learn all of this in the first chapter. At the very end of the first chapter, we will see Nick seeing Gatsby for the first time looking across the bay. Of course, the green light that will be associated symbolically with hope, verde, freedom, uh, the, the goal, right, of, of Daisy. He'll see Gatsby, but we know nothing more about Gatsby. Fritz Schell has this genius way of allowing us to see the world through Nick's eyes. And slowly Nick comes to realize who this Gatsby person is. Uh, chapter 2. Well, we open chapter two um, by, uh, by working specifically in the prose again. And um, we're told about the differences between the settings. And here, we're going to hear about this area between New York City and, uh, and where all this action is going to take place out on Long Island. And I'll just begin by reading, because there's so much significance to this passage that starts chapter two, second paragraph. But above the gray land and the spasms of bleak dust which drift endlessly over it, you perceive after a moment the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg. The eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg are blue and gigantic. Their retinas are one yard high. This is a sign. They look out of no face, but instead from a pair of enormous yellow spectacles which pass over a non-existent nose Evidently some wild wag of an occultist set them there to fatten his practice in the borough of Queens and then sank down himself into the eternal blindness or forgot them and moved away. But his eyes dimmed a little by many paint, uh, paintless days under sun and rain brood on over the solemn 
dumping ground. So you've got this ash valley, and then you've got this sign, and you've got these eyes that are always watching. And of course, these eyes become powerfully symbolic. The Valley of Ashes is bound on one side, now to continue Fitzgerald, is bound on one side by a small foul river, and when the drawbridge is up to let barges through, the passengers on waiting trains can stare at the dismal scene for as long as half an hour. There is always a halt there of at least a minute, and it was because of this that I first met Tom Buchanan's mistress. Now, Tom and Nick will go into the city. They will pass through the Valley of Ashes. They will meet Myrtle Wilson, who will be Tom's mistress, love interest. And we will see Tom is incredibly abusive. Myrtle understands that the best attention for her is negative attention. So she'll speak of Daisy. She'll create in Tom this rage. And he will slap her so hard he breaks her nose. So it tells us a lot about who Tom is. Chapter 3 will introduce us to the next element of our story, the lifestyle. And it will open by giving us some sense of what a Gatsby party is like. There was music from a neighbor's house through the summer nights. In his blue gardens, men and girls came and went like moths among the whispering and the champagne and the stars. A high tide in the afternoon, I watched his guests diving from the tower of his raft or taking the sun on the hot sand of his beach while his two motorboats slit the, water, the waters of the sound, drawing aquaplanes over cataracts of foam. On weekends, his Rolls Royce became an omnibus bearing parties to and from the city between nine in the morning and long past midnight, while his station wagon scampered like a brisk yellow bug to meet all trains. And on Mondays, eight servants, including an extra gardener, toiled all day with mops and scrubbing brushes and hammers and garden shears, repairing the ravages of the night before. Gatsby parties. We're going to have all kinds of insanity, and obviously filmmakers love this part of it, to be able to just demonstrate the gratuitous kinds of insane chaotic parties that will happen at um, Gatsby's uh, abode, at his mansion. Nick will be there. He is going to be with jo Jordan Baker, who he struggles to try to relate to. Jordan, a golfer. Jordan, uh, a woman who... She, she has no real sense of the truth or of reality. She's willing to cheat, for example, even in silly golfing events or whatever, because she has no sense of purpose of any kind. She obviously is symbol. And then finally, we will have Nick with Gatsby himself. And uh, Nick, as well, will spend some time speaking with Jordan Baker. And it will become obvious that this Gatsby character is a complete enigma to everyone. And Nick is now, of course, interested, as we the readers will be as well. It will be in chapter 4 that we will meet Gatsby for the first real time with Nick. And they quickly become pals. Now it will become clear that what Gatsby wants from Nick is that relationship that Nick has to his cousin Daisy. Why? Because we're going to learn that Gatsby has had a prior relationship with Daisy before she married Tom, before she had a child, and that's going to be at the heart of the conflict of our text itself. In the city, however, Nick will meet Wolfisham, which is going to be one of these criminal underbelly types that will for the first time give Nick a sense that something is seriously wrong with Gatsby, suspect with Gatsby. And yet, Nick, at the same time of being repelled by Gatsby in some ways, is very attracted to Gatsby as well. He's, again, trying to figure out who is this guy. And in that regards, Jordan will uh, then finally tell Nick, begin to unfold slowly for Nick what's going on, uh, that Gatsby and, and, and Daisy once had a thing many years ago. And then finally, Gatsby will ask Nick straight up to arrange a meeting with Daisy at his house, but he tells him, don't let Daisy know about it, which takes us to chapter 5. Nick will then invite Daisy over for tea, and you have this very interesting exchange where Gatsby all of a sudden shows himself, Nick will call him, you're acting like a little child, stop acting this way. Gatsby, of course, is delirious because now he gets to meet Daisy again after so many years being gone. And they come together, very quickly they remind each other why they loved each other in the first place. Gatsby will invite both Nick and Daisy to his mansion, where he will, for lack of a better phrase, show off. In other words, we come to realize, I get it. So in other words, Gatsby did all of this work so that he could 
uh, build a world that would attract Daisy into it, to prove to Daisy that he was worth her attention. And in some ways, we, along with Nick, begin to kind of feel a little bit pathetic for the great Gatsby. Chapter 6, we get Nick uh, hearing a, an interesting history lesson from Gatsby. We find out that actually Gatsby's not his real name. His name is James Gats, and that he came from the Midwest, and he came from poverty, and he had a mentor named uh, Dan Cody who gave, left some money for him, but he ultimately didn't end up with this money. In other words, Gatsby is always the guy who's just about to get the thing he wants, and then it doesn't happen for him. And then we finish chapter 6 with another Gatsby party, where, interestingly, Tom and Daisy show up, and this will be the first time that Tom begins to uh, suspect something's going on between my wife and this guy. Um, and the, at the end of, the, of chapter 6, we'll, uh, we'll realize everyone's partying, but nobody's having a good time. I think that's central uh, and a central idea uh, of this novel. Bringing us to chapter 7, of course, there are nine chapters in this novel, to chapter 7, so we're coming now to the end of the novel. And you have Nick, and you have Gatsby, and they are at lunch with Tom and Daisy, and it is tense. It is clear now that Tom definitely suspects something is up between his wife and this Gatsby character. They elect to go into the city. You'll notice in this novel, some, some readers have said, this is such a boring novel, to which, uh, yeah, that's the whole point. These people live these really boring lives where other people do real work, you know, and, and these, these people, they have nothing to do. And so in their nothingness to do, they decide to take a journey in two separate cars into the city, and uh, Gatsby's famous yellow car is going to be a part of it. Now, cars have been a, a foundational part of our story. Of course, the automobile, by the time Fitzgerald's setting this novel, the automobile has become a, a big deal. It's a status thing as well. Um, and, and we have wrecks all the time happening. Poor drivers, this is going to be one of the, the... The way in which technology can just damage everything, and the people of wealth don't seem to care whatsoever. So off they go, and in the city, Tom will then have this confrontation with Gatsby. And it will bring, of course, Daisy into it. And Daisy admits that she does love Gatsby. Gatsby believes that Daisy will leave Tom for him. Now, of course, there is a child involved. And it's interesting that Gatsby never seems to really care too much about that part of the equation. Uh, but Tom will reassure Gatsby. There isn't any way she's going to go for you. Tom will accuse Gatsby of being a criminal, that in fact he has received all of this wealth in illegal ways, which we're, we're going to learn is in fact true, and it will be in this moment that a large fight will erupt, and Gatsby and Daisy will leave. And it's, it's kind of like the reader will wonder, hmm, are they going to, are they, are they actually, is Daisy going to actually leave and run away and leave Tom? And off they go driving in Gatsby's beautiful uh, yellow car. Um, and now the, the central horror of the novel will unfold because on their way home, Myrtle, Tom's mistress, comes out of the garage and she sees the car coming and she will come into the road and she is killed, struck by the car in a terrible random accident. And it will be Daisy who is driving, although at the moment we don't realize that. And then later Gatsby will confide to Nick that, in fact, he will take the blame for this. And interestingly, Daisy's going to let that happen as well. Um, it's a powerful pathos moment, and Fitzgerald is drawing heavily on ancient Greek drama and melodrama even, some will say, in this scene. It's a brutal scene, and of course, this is one of the central scenes always in any film that you will watch of this. Chapter 8 and 9, of course, the conclusion of the novel now comes, comes really quickly. We have another kind of quote-unquote Gatsby history lesson, as it's sometimes uh, called, where more revelations are made. And in the end, Gatsby will say, it's always been about Daisy, it's always been about the girl. And, um, and then Gatsby, at the conclusion of chapter 8, goes for a swim in his pool, ironically telling uh, his gardener not to empty it because he's going to go for a swim in his pool and it will be there that George Wilson, the, fa the, the husband of, of uh, Myrtle, who is the lover of Tom, believing that in fact it was Gatsby who killed his wife um, and uh, probably was having an affair or something like that as well, 
Um, he will find uh, Gatsby in his pool. He will shoot Gatsby. He will kill Gatsby in his pool, and then he will kill himself. So chapter 8, the tragic end of Gatsby. Chapter 9 is the way we finish the novel. Uh, Nick with Gatsby's father, and that's a tragic, tragic um, um, conversation because Henry Gatz will say, my son has such tremendous uh, um, ability and, and challenges in terms of his poverty, but ability, and he never, he never materialized. He never became what he could have been. Nick is uh, then going to throw uh, a funeral for Gatsby that virtually nobody attends. So there's this recognition, again, Buildings Roman, this recognition that, oh, you can do all of that, and nobody cares at all. It's kind of sad, kind of tragic for Nick. Um, and then, to end the novel, Nick will meet Tom uh, on Fifth Avenue in New York City, and Tom will confide to him that actually he was the one that told George Wilson that, uh, you know, you should go and take care of Gatsby, and that's exactly what happened. Of course, in the end, Gatsby is, is, is never going to get the girl. Daisy and Tom will have left. They leave all the chaos behind them, and off they go. This kind of cavalier attitude will drive most readers of the novel absolutely crazy. At the very end of the novel, though, Fitzgerald's in his saddest lugubrious, I'll use that adjective, lugubrious, sad, mournful language as he tries to represent Nick at the very end of this building's Roman. On the last night, Nick now speaking, on the last night with my trunk packed and my car sold to the grocer, I went over and looked at that huge incoherent failure of a house once more. Gadsby's mansion shut down. On the white steps, an obscene word scrawled by some boy with a piece of brick stood out clearly in the moonlight, and I erased it, drawing my shoe raspingly 